Good evening, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the public informational meeting for state project number 161-145, replacement of bridge number 4981 on the in the town of Wilton, which carries Cannon Road over the Norwalk River. My name is Mark Burns, and I'm from the Connecticut Department of Transportation, and welcome you to this live event for the public info. If you would like to ask any questions, you can reach out via project e email, and you can also ask a question by phone at 860-594-2020. The project webpage can also be visited by the uh, link listed below at portal.ct.gov slash DOT Wilton 161-145. If you'd like to view this presentation in closed captions and subtitles, you can select the show closed captions icon, click the speaking language and select the language you would like from the list shown. Closed captioning, including non-English translation options are available on YouTube after the event. As I said, my name is Mark Burns. I'm the project manager for the state DOT local bridge programs. And here's my contact information. Email is the best way to reach me if you have a question. I have to read this slide regarding Title VI and civil rights. No person shall on the basis of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation or subject to discrimination in the development of this project. We highly encourage you to fill out the voluntary post-meeting survey located at the website below or available at the QR code shown. There is also a link to civil rights information as well regarding Title VI. A recording of this presentation will also be posted to YouTube after the event, and we have the closed caption options on the Zoom. This is another slide regarding Title VI and a notice to the public. The goals for tonight's meeting are to interact with the project team, to explain the Federal Local Bridge Program Design Managed by State or DMS program, We'll have some welcoming remarks by the town of Wilton. We'll also introduce the project team. And then there'll be a formal presentation of the design progress, which will explain the condition of the existing bridge and define the purpose and need for its replacement. And we'll recommend a viable proposal. Please keep in mind at this point, we're roughly about 30% complete, which is at the time that we will solicit public comment and try to incorporate any concerns or or um, requests where applicable. Following the presentation, there'll be an open forum to any questions and answers. There's, to access the Zoom Q&A function, you have to select the Zoom Q&A tool at the bottom of the webinar window, which will then pop up the Q&A, and then you will type in your question and click enter. If you're audio only participant, please dial star nine to raise and lower your hand. Following the presentation, there is also other ways to reach us in during the presentation. You can access us by email at dot-flbp at ct.gov, by monitored phone line at 860-594-2020, which is a voicemail, or in the live Q&A. The comment period is also open until October 17th, 2023. Please keep in mind the Zoom Q&A function is only available during the live presentation. This project is funded through the Federal Local Bridge Program and the, and the Design Managed by State or DMS program. In the past, on Federal Local Bridge projects, projects were funded with 80% federal dollars and a 20% town match for design rights away and construction. With DMS, the department uses our consultant liaisons or CLEs and our pre-selected on-call designers to design the project on behalf of the town. We are also going to be responsible for right-of-way acquisitions, and the town will be responsible for holding the construction contract. All phases will be funded with 80% federal and 20% state funds. So design rights and construction are at no cost to the town. Even though we're doing the design, it is still a full partnership and coordination with the town, and we solicit their input at, any, at all project milestones. The reason for using the DMS program was to provide a streamlined approach to design using DOT resources, to aid the towns to keep their municipally owned bridges in a state of good repair by effectively using funds, to decrease our typical design time from 48 to 60 months to 24 to 36 months, and to utilize accelerated bridge construction or ABC techniques 
to shorten construction duration. The ultimate goal of the department is also to increase the number of projects that are delivered in each construction year. I'll now turn it over to Frank Smeriglio, who is the Director of Public Works and Town Engineer for the Town of Wilton. Frank? Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, but so my name is Frank Smeriglio. I'm the Director of Public Works, Town Engineer. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining in tonight. Uh, Cannon Road, uh, just a quick overview. Cannon Road is uh, one of 28 bridges in Wilton as part of our overall master planning for the bridges. Uh, Wilton was fortunate enough and was awarded the uh, Federal Local Bridge Grant to reconstruct Cannon, Cannon Bridge. Um, currently there's two bridges under construction as part of this program, um, Arrowhead, uh, Arrowhead Bridge and the uh, bridge at Lover's Lane. The Arrowhead Bridge is a little bit farther along. Um, uh, more than welcome to take, take a ride by there. Um, and Lover's Lane, um, Lover's Lane is uh, under construction too. Um, on uh, this past Tuesday, we had, an, we had another informational meeting for the Honey Hill Road Bridge um, because that's, that's in design phase also. Um, I, I definitely welcome and encourage residents to ask questions at the end of the meeting. And if there's any pertinent information uh, that you'd like to provide us, uh, definitely uh, feel free to uh, contact us to let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. I'll now introduce the project team. To the top left is Bart Sweeney, our manager or division chief of bridge design. Next to him is Derek Lassard, our principal engineer. As I said, I am Mark Burns, project manager. Also with us is Andrew Shields, the project engineer. From the Division of Rights Way is Zachary Garino. And from CHA, our consultant liaisons is Anin Sasadri and Tom Sautel, who is the project engineer. This slide uh, illustrates the stru bridge structural design elements and condition ratings. The driving or walking or biking surface is known as the deck and pedestrians and vehicles are protected by the parapets carrying the deck are the bridge superstructure, which will be steel or concrete beams. Supporting the superstructure and all those elements are the abutments and along with wing walls to retain soil. That is also known as the substructure. And in some instances, depending on the length of the bridge, there'll be a pier or multiple piers depending on the span. All, can, all structural elements of a bridge are rated on a scale of one to nine, with nine being an excellent condition and one being an imminent failure. And notice the bridge we are discussing this evening is rated in poor condition. There is no immediate concern for the traveling public. This slide illustrates different examples of concrete deterioration based on certain environmental factors and just general wear and tear. Efflorescence shown in the top left is a chemical reaction which causes different elements within the concrete to start um, being exposed through the exterior pieces. Honeycombing is an instance during significant freeze thaw or cyclical freeze thaw events, which causes the concrete to react this way. Scaling is generally from impacts, usually from plows or other low vehicles to the wearing surface. Map cracking is another instance with uh, either settlement cracking or cracking due to loads. And then in a more serious condition is spalling where Water has gotten into cracks and it's caused various parts of the concrete to pop out from the rest of it, exposing the reinforcement as shown here. I'll now turn it over to Tom to begin the formal presentation. Tom? Thanks, Mark. Uh, good evening, everybody. This is Thomas Sautel with CHA. I'm the project engineer assigned to this project. And tonight we're talking about the replacement of bridge 4981, which is Cannon Road over the Norwalk River. So to begin, um, here's a project location map. Uh, bridge 4981 is located here and conveys bi-directional bi traffic in an east to west direction over Cannon Road. Um, to orient everybody, Further to the west of the bridge site is the intersection of Cannon Road with Route 7 or Danbury Road. And then closer to the bridge, but also still west, is the at-grade Metro North Rail Crossing, as well as the uh, Cannondale train station. To the east of the bridge 
Uh, we have the intersection with Pimpawag Road and Cannon Road. And finally, uh, it's important to note that the entire project site is part of the historic Cannon Village District. Uh, two noteworthy properties that I've highlighted in green, uh, to the northwest is the historic Cannon Village property, and to the southwest is the Cannon Grange. The last thing I wanna mention is that the Norwalk River flows under this bridge from north to south, or top of the page uh, to bottom of the page. So to talk about Cannon Road um, at the bridge site, it conveys two travel lanes over the bridge and there's a total curb to curb width of 22 feet, which is the first thing I wanna note is that the width is currently substandard. Uh, the second thing, and it's easier to see here in the bottom right photo, we've got a five foot wide sidewalk on the north side of the bridge, as well as a one foot seven inch uh, safety walk on the south side. Both of these features are also substandard. The average daily traffic is 2,061 vehicles per day, and that's based on traffic counts performed in July, 2022. From these traffic counts, we got an 85th percentile speed of 27 miles an hour, and a speed limit at this site is 25 miles an hour. So we selected a design speed of 30 miles an hour for this project. The last thing I wanna note is that Cannon Road is a urban collector street. So speaking to the structure uh, specifically, it was constructed in 1956. So it's 67 years old today. It consists of two 36 foot one inch spans as I'm showing here in the bottom center photo, uh, which gives us a total length of the bridge of 75 feet. The bridge components are, consist of a superstructure, which is pre-stressed concrete deck units, a substructure, which is concrete abutments and a center pier, and a foundation, which is spread footings on soil. Um, note, you can't see the foundation in this photo because it's below the, the water line. The second thing I wanna point out with this bridge is that there currently are no good as-built plans. And because of this, there's no real accurate way to determine the uh, load bearing capacity of the bridge. And because of that, a judgment rating has been assigned to this bridge uh, due to the absence of this extra in information. Speaking to the hydraulics of the site in the Norwalk River, um, for this bridge, the design storm is the 100 year storm. The bridge has a hydraulic clear span of 68 and a half feet, um, which is the distance between the abutment and center pier in the first span. And obviously the, from the pier to the second abutment in the second span. This gives us a uh, dimension that is greater than 1.2 times the bank full width, which is 56 feet at this site. Uh, also, the backwater elevation compared to the natural, uh, which basically is a comparison of the water surface elevation with the bridge in place um, versus the natural condition where if the bridge were taken out and you just had a stream is 0.8 feet, which is less than the one foot uh, maximum requirement. The underclearance at this bridge is 0.1 feet. And the underclearance is defined as the, from the water surface elevation for that 100 year storm as I'm shown in blue, to the low point of the bridge, which in this case is the, the lowest portion of the uh, pre-stressed deck units. The freeboard at the roadway low point, which is located further to the west and away from this photo, is zero feet, which is also less than the one foot minimum. The fourth thing I wanna point out is that we're dealing with a scour critical bridge. And what that means is the foundation is unstable for the de design scour event. So as Mark mentioned, uh, structures in the state are inspected on a biannual basis. The last time the structure was inspected was in October of 2021. And based on that inspection, uh, the deck was found to be in satisfactory condition. The superstructure is in satisfactory condition substructure is in good condition, the approach is in poor condition, the channel and channel protection is in satisfactory condition. Two other items I wanna note 
are that the bridge railing is in satisfactory condition and the approach guide rail system is in serious condition. Um, both of these features do not meet current safety standards. So the next few slides are some photos um, showing the site and the bridge. In the top left, I've got a north elevation of the bridge shown, which is the inlet. In the top right is a south elevation of the bridge, which is the outlet. I just want to point out right now that in the westerly span is primarily where flows of the Norwalk River are conveyed. The, the easterly span, um, water really only seems to run through this during higher storm events. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later in the, in the presentation. The bottom left photo is a west approach along Cannon Road looking east towards the bridge. The first arrow I'm pointing out is the Metro North at grade crossing located west of the bridge. And the arrow in the background is showing where the bridge is. Um, also, this shows the Cannon Village shops and the Cannon Grange. The bottom right photo is looking west over the bridge, standing at the intersection with Pimplewog Road. The two arrows that I'm pointing up here are locations of the overhead utilities, which run parallel to the south side of the bridge. In the top left photo, is the west approach from the bridge. Um, note, here's the Metro North at grade crossing. The top right photo is a close up of the intersection with Pimplewog Road. The bottom left photo is a shot of the bridge rail and sidewalk. Again, the bridge rail and sidewalk don't meet current standards. The bottom right photo is a close up of the approach guide rail system, which also doesn't meet standards as well as the roadway drainage that exists out there. It's important to note that the drainage out there today, um, based on preliminary analysis, is inadequate. In the top left photo is a close-up of the Cannon Grange. In the top right photo is a close-up of the Cannon Dale Village shops. The bottom left photo is a shot looking at the Cannondale Station, as well as the Act Grade Metro North Crossing. And finally, the bottom right photo, I'm pointing to the two historic gas pumps and turbine that exists on the Cannondale Village shop property north uh, west of the bridge. In the top left and top right photos, I'm showing the underside of the bridge superstructure in spans one and spans two, respectfully. Um, as you can see, there's evidence of leakage just based on the, the efflorescence um, between the joints that exist uh, between the adjacent deck units. In the bottom uh, left photo is a shot of the center pier. That's in pretty nice shape. The bottom right photo is a close up of the west abutment and southwest wing wall. The red arrow is pointing to where the drainage currently outfalls through this west abutment today. The top left photo is a close up of the northeast wing wall. The top right is a close up of the northwest wing wall and stone masonry wall. The bottom left is a shot of the Norwalk River looking upstream from the bridge. And the bottom right is a shot of the Norwalk River looking downstream from the bridge. So, as I've mentioned, there's several um, issues and deficiencies with the existing structure, and the project's purpose and need is to address those deficiencies. So as part of this project, we want to increase the roadway and sidewalk widths to meet current standards. We want to eliminate the scour critical deficiency that exists with the existing structure. We want to replace the bridge and approach rail systems to meet current safety standards. We want to be able to confirm the load carrying capacity of the bridge. We want to improve the hydraulic adequacy and performance of the bridge. And finally, the bridge is nearing uh, the end of its service life as it's 67 years old, constructed in 1956. So because of those issues for this project, we're going with a full bridge replacement. Now, just to reiterate, like Mark mentioned, um, despite these deficiencies mentioned, the bridge is safe for the traveling public um, since there's biannual inspections performed by Connecticut DOT. So under this project, what we're proposing is actually two structures. So 
in the west, it'll be a new steel beam bridge. And the east will be a smaller precast uh, box culvert structure. Both of these structures will be able to carry the Ashto uh, design legal and permit vehicle loads. Uh, we're going with a widened roadway width of 24 feet and a widened sidewalk to five feet, six inches, the current standards. We're also going with open bridge rail systems to meet current safety standards. Uh, the, for the bridge particularly, we're going with a pile foundation that'll be designed for scour. And finally, both of these structures will have 75 year service lives and minimal anticipated future maintenance. For, for these two um, bridges, we're gonna also improve the hydraulic performance as part of this project. And so with this new uh, steel beam bridge, we're actually going with a wider clear span um, that will allow us to eliminate the center pier that's out there today, which will help to uh, reduce an obstruction in the flow in the main channel. It'll also um, help to minimize any uh, issues with aggradation or migration in that easterly span that doesn't see a lot of load today. Um, so for the steel beam bridge, like I mentioned, it's going to be a 56 foot clear span, which will satisfy the 1.2 times bank full width requirement at the site. And the easterly precast box culvert will have a 21 foot uh, clear span. What both of these structures will ultimately provide us is a reduced backwater elevation from 0.8 feet to 0.5 feet, as well as a slightly improved freeboard condition from the zero feet that's out there today to 0.3 feet. And finally, um, given the historic nature of this site and the importance on aesthetics that the town has, um, we're gonna make some improvements to the bridge visually. So the first thing that we're gonna be doing is real masonry facing on the end blocks and on exposed portions of the wing walls similar to what's shown in the example photo in the top, as well as in the bottom left. We're also gonna go with a new open bridge rail and metal beams that will be metalized to a color of the town's choice. Again, similar to the photo in the top, as well as the photo in the center. And finally, we're going with uh, decorative light fixtures at all four corners of the steel beam bridge, similar to the schematic that I'm showing in the bottom right. So here's a plan view of the two proposed structures. Uh, just to orient everybody, we're looking from west to east along Cannon Road. The Norwalk River is shown and highlighted out in light blue. And the two new structures are highlighted in orange. Um, so as I mentioned previously, we're going with a widened steel beam structure for the westerly span. Um, and to, to accomplish this, we're gonna leave the westerly abutment approximately in the same location. The center pier will be eliminated completely from the existing structure. And the easterly um, abutment will be moved further to the west uh, to provide us a widened 56 foot clear span steel bridge. For the Easter structure, easterly structure, like I mentioned, it's gonna be a precast box culvert with a 21 foot clear span. Additionally, we're going with curved um, wing walls at all four corners of the bridge. And the last thing I wanna note is that we're going with brand new closed drainage structures um, at the west approach to the bridge, as well as the east approach to the bridge. And they're gonna drain um, in the south west and southeast quadrants on the bridge, as I'm showing here. So here's a south elevation view of the two structures. So again, here's the westerly steel beam bridge with two brand new concrete abutments and a foundation that's founded on piles socketed into bedrock that'll be designed for scour. Then we've got the easterly 21 foot span by seven foot rise Precast box culvert. Uh, speaking to the aesthetics specifically, we've got the decorative lighting shown at all four corners of the bridge. We've got real masonry facing on the end blocks, the curved barrier walls, as well as the exposed portions of the wing walls. 
And then finally, I just want to mention again, um, I've highlighted this in red, the patched little regions um, as shown are show the center pier as well as the locations of the existing abutments of the bridge. And as you can see, we're eliminating that center pier, uh, keeping the approximate location of the, the westerly abutment the same and moving that easterly abutment further west to accommodate this widened westerly span. So here's a section view of the westerly proposed steel beam bridge looking east. Um, so to start out, we've got the widened five and a half foot sidewalk to the north and the widened 24 foot curb to curb roadway width, which will give us two 10 foot travel lanes and two two foot wide shoulders. We've also got for the superstructure, three inches of bituminous asphalt with a new uh, concrete deck and steel beams for the superstructure. Here is a section view looking east for the precast uh, concrete box culvert. All the roadway geometry will be exactly the same as the steel beam bridge. Uh, and the only other thing I wanna mention is that we have, we're showing the rise of seven feet for this box, as well as cutoff walls and return walls that will be uh, designed to mitigate any scour concerns. Here is a proposed roadway plan showing the full project limits. Um, again, so to orient everybody to the west, pointing out the Metro North at grade crossing, then continuing on Cannon Road from west to east, we've got the intersection with Pimplewog Road. I'm showing the Norwalk River in light blue. The two new structures are in orange. And the main thing I want to point out here is that I'm showing the full reconstruction limits of 285 feet in yellow at both approaches to the bridge. Um, also, we're going to maintain the horizontal alignment that's out there today on Cannon Road. What this will do is minimize our impacts to the adjacent historic properties. It'll minimize any impacts to Metro North to the west. And it'll also minimize our impacts to the intersection with Pimple Log Road. We're not going with any approach guide rails um, on this bridge. Instead, we're going with curved walls that will be terminated outside the clear zone in all four corners, as I'm showing here. Um, finally, the last thing I want to point out is that we're going to include sidewalks at both approaches to the bridge. So I've highlighted those in red. Uh, the sidewalk from the west approach, we'll begin at the driveway of the Cannon Village shops, continue onto the bridge on the north side, and then keep going further east and terminate at the intersection with Temple Log Road. So this next slide showing the proposed roadway profile. And as you can see, we're not making too many uh, changes to this profile, just some spot improvements. And the reason why we're doing that is we're, we're locked in with the Accrade Metro North Crossing and the intersection with Pimple Log Road. And again, we also want to minimize impacts to the historic properties um, as well. So for construction of this bridge, we're anticipating a full closure and detour. Uh, the shorter route, which I'm showing on the screen, is highlighted in purple. So users at Bridge 4981 uh, will be able to continue uh, further west along Cannon Road and go up north onto Route 7 or Danbury Road, followed by they're going to be able to turn east onto Sealy Road and then back south again for a short stint on Cannon Road until they're back at the intersection of Temple Long. This detour is 2.4 miles and six minutes. And what it'll do is provide a safe work zone for the residents commuters and the contractor during construction of the new bridge. We're anticipating a two season construction due to utility moves, which I'll get into a little bit later. And finally, um, as Frank mentioned, uh, we had the PIM meeting Tuesday night for the adjacent Honey Hill Road bridge replacement project further to the north. We're gonna be coordinating this detour and closure with that project given their close proximity. So speaking to the environmental impacts of this project, um, we're gonna be performing some tree clearing. 
along the roadway, uh, both to the north and to the south. We're also going to need some temporary and permanent wetland and watercourse impacts to construct the new bridges. In terms of historic impacts around the site, uh, we're anticipating them to be very minimal. And finally, I just want to point out that from a permitting standpoint, we're coordinating with town, state, and federal agencies. So this next slide, I'm showing our right-of-way and utility impact plan uh, for the project. Again, to orient everybody, we've got the Metro North at grade crossing to the west. We're following Cannon Road from west to east. And then we've got the intersection with Pimpawag Road here. The Norwalk River is here. And we've got the two bridge limits approximately here as I'm highlighting out in my pointer right now. To the north side, um, there's two properties um, affected. And to construct the bridge, we're going to need some partial takes, um, slope easements, and temporary construction easements. To the south side, including, including the Cannon Grange property to the southwest, we're going to need um, partial or temporary construction easements and drainage right of ways. We're going to need the temporary construction easements uh, primarily for temporary overhead utility relocations. As I mentioned, there's overhead utilities located along the south of the bridge out there today. To construct the new bridge, given how tight the site is, we're going to need to move the utilities further to the south. And I've shown those limits approximately in the yellow highlighted line here. And that's why we need the temporary construction easement. Um, upon completion of the new bridge, the utilities will be moved uh, back closer to uh, Cannon Road, similar to the configuration that's out there today. Now I'm going to pass it off to Zach, who will explain a little more on the rights away process. Thanks, Tom. My name is Zachary Garino, and I'm a project coordinator with the department's division of rights of way. Our office is responsible for acquiring the property rights needed for transportation projects. As mentioned in the presentation, this project will require the acquisition of property rights, so I'd like to give a brief overview of our acquisition process. Before I begin, I'd like to mention that the specific impacts are still being finalized and may change as the design progresses and that the required property rights will be acquired in accordance with Connecticut General Statutes sections 13A73 and 13A98E, as well as the Uniform Act. Change the slide. The right-of-way acquisition process begins once a design has progressed to a development milestone and all the impacts have been determined. At this point, each affected property owner will receive a formal letter of intent to acquire from our office, along with a property map which depicts the exact property rights to be acquired. And on the screen here is an example of a property map that an owner would receive. The impacts are gonna be specific to their property. It's gonna be showing the proposed impacts as well as existing conditions. Um, next, our office will determine the fair market value of those property rights that have been depicted on the property map, which will be used to establish an offer of just compensation. That offer will be sent out to the property owner in writing and a right of way agent will be available to meet with the property owner and explain the project go over the specific impacts to their property and explain the state's offer. The property owner will be given a reasonable amount of time, typically 30 days to consider the state's offer and enter into negotiations. When an agreement is reached, the department will prepare all the necessary paperwork to record the deed and property map on the town land records. However, if an agreement cannot be reached in order to keep on schedule, the department may acquire the necessary property rights through its power of eminent domain. In that event, the state files a notice of condemnation in the Superior Court, along with a monetary deposit in the amount of the state's offer. The owner would have six months from that date to file an appeal if they felt that the state's offer was inadequate. Whether or not the owner chooses to appeal, the money deposited in the court is available to be withdrawn by the owner. It's important to note that the state only acquires property rights that are needed for the project. If there are any questions regarding the right-of-way acquisition process, I can answer them after the presentation. With that, I'll hand it back to Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. So for the schedule on this project, uh, we're anticipating construction to start in the spring of 2026. Again, that's subject to all permit approvals. 
As I mentioned, we're going with a construction duration of 16 months or two years due to the utility moves. And the anticipated construction cost at this time is $6,720,000. And for funding on this project, it's gonna be 80% federal funds and 20% state funds. So there's no cost to the town. Now I'm gonna pass this off to Andrew who can open up the live Q&A part of the presentation. Hi, good evening, everyone. This now begins the question and answer session of our VPIM tonight. So you can either reach out to us by email at dot-flbp at ct.gov. You can reach us uh, by phone at 860-594-2020 by the instant chat in Zoom itself on the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Our project webpage is also available at https colon double slash portals.ct.gov slash BOT Wilton 161-145. Our comment period is open through October 17th, 2023. So that gives us two weeks in order for you to get any questions you may either have tonight or in the next couple of days, um, you are able to ask us questions via any of these features over the next two weeks. So feel free, um, if you, anyone in this meeting currently has any questions, we are monitoring the Q&A for the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew and Tom and Zach. Again, at this time, we're calling for any questions or comments from the public. You can reach out to us by phone or email or um, reaching out to the uh, various project emails at this time. Thank you. All right, everyone. So seeing no question oh, or comment. Oh. Um, Andrew, we have a question coming in from yes. Sarah Curtis. Yes, please, please uh, clarify or confirm. Will the bridge be fully closed during the construction period? Tom, can you field that question? Absolutely. Uh, again, this is Tom Sautel with CHA. Um, we're anticipating the bridge will be fully closed throughout the duration of construction. Tom, do you want to pull up the detour map? There you go. Yeah. Also, how long will this be closed for, Tom? How long? Uh, so it's going to be for 16 months or approximately two years is what we're anticipating. And that's due to the overhead utility moves 
um, on the south side of the bridge. And, and again, the, you know, the wild card to the schedule is the utility relocations uh, because we don't control Eversource. Um, we work with them during the design. We give them, we give them a schedule of what we anticipate, uh, but they're always uh, because there's less control over Eversource. Uh, you know, um, their time frame can be longer um, just by just by the nature of, of dealing with Eversource. So they're they're a big uh, they're a big wild card in the um, in the project schedule. All right, thank you, Frank and Tom. We have another question from Barbara. Will the Cannon Grange Hall have access during this time? Tom, do you want to take that? Yeah, I can take that. I'm just getting the uh, the right away slide here. Yeah, um, again, this is Tom Sautel with CHA. Um, great question. Yes, so the Cannon Grange will have access throughout uh, duration of construction. We were looking at that actually um, a little bit last week, and it looks like there are two um, there are two driveways um, around the site. We're going to do our best to try and keep them both open, um, but worst case, it'll probably be access to to one of the driveways. Great, thank you, Tom. All right, Tom. On the same on the same note. Um... Vitala has a question. Will there be any impact due to the two drive uh, to the two driveways of Cannon Green, mainly meaning closure? Okay, uh, Tom Sautel again from CHA. So like I said, we're gonna maintain access to at least one of the driveways. Um, we're, we're aiming for two. Uh, it's a really tight site and you know, we, we're going to have to look at those details a little bit further as we go into final design with this project. Um, but we're confident we can keep at least one of the driveways open and access to the to the properties. All right, thank you, Tom. We have one other question here from an anonymous anonymous attendee. Uh, will the required drainage easements provide compensation to the owners? Zach, can you fill yep. that one, please? Yep. Uh, yes, the uh, drainage easements, um, we're meeting with the owners and determining the impacts. We typically use comparable sales to determine the value of those easements. We have to be compensation for them, along with any of the impacts for this project. Great. All right, thank you very much, Zach. You're welcome. And we have one more question from Sarah. What plans are being made to ensure the safety for those who will have route, uh, who will have uh, to cross Route 7 there's four lanes with no traffic light there, making a left turn to turn south onto Route 7 from Pippawag dangerous. Um, Frank, would you like to take this question? Yes. Um, so one of the so this is at the um, this is at the intersection of Pippawag and Route 7. Uh, one of the design considerations that we're looking at, and this this will you know we'll, we'll need state input on this is to uh, consideration to put a temporary light there at that intersection. Um, there's, there's a lot of hurdles that have to happen to, to get that approval, uh, but that's what we're looking at um, as, part of the, as part of the preliminary um, design for this. Um, Tom, Tom, can you just add a little bit more to just the process of getting the, um, the temporary lights approved? Um, I'm gonna actually pass this to our highway lead, Jeff LeMay. Uh, from CHA. I know he's more familiar with traffic signals than I am. Tom, I apologize. Can you, um, I, I just had uh, another call come in. Can you just repeat that briefly real quick? So Frank's asking about the process for uh, getting a temporary signal installed at the intersection with Route 7 and Pimpawag Road. Yeah, so that's that's definitely something um, that's going to be evaluated during design. Obviously, there's a signal right now um, at Cannon Road and Route 7. Um, there's a high volume of traffic right now on Cannon Road. So if we send that traffic to another intersection, um, we're obviously going to have to take that into consideration. Um, so that definitely will be uh, worked out during design. Uh, temporary signals are set up 
um, quite often on construction sites to handle situations like this. So um, the department is not gonna set up a, a detour or a maintenance protection of traffic situation where we're gonna create issues. So that'll definitely be worked out during design. Thanks, right. Jeff. Sure. Hey, Jeff, I think I might have one more question for you from Barbara. Sure. Um, she agrees that Pipawag has poor sight lines before this closure and has been cited for it many times. Uh, she just wants you to look at Pipawag <clears throat> yeah. uh, for the traffic or uh, sight lines. Yep. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, that's something we look at all the time when we're dealing with uh, intersections or driveways. Um, anytime that we're doing work on a roadway and we're um, designing new features, we have to look at uh, the existing sight lines. And I can tell you that intersection that she's speaking about um, does have a lot of vegetation that's really close to the road. Um, and with the type of work that we're doing, installing the sidewalk, installing the, the bridge, um, uh, the bridge parapet walls and the wing walls, we're gonna be cutting that vegetation back. And that will certainly improve the sight line uh, at that intersection. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, we have a question from Mary. Uh, what happens if you live in the village? And I'm assuming this has to do with the detour and access during construction. So, so access to, I mean, so access to all the driveways will uh, will continue throughout the project. Um, uh, so there's the driveway access access to the north uh, with with the one entrance that'll that'll always contractor will always have to allow traffic in and out um, and then you know with the grange again there's there's two driveway entrances um, that definitely it'll have one driveway entrance and, and we'll do the best we can with the second driveway entrance uh, that's closest to the bridge. And just to add to add to uh, what Frank said. For majority of the time, you know, it, it'll be open, but except when we are doing some roadway construction uh, in the vicinity of the driveway, when we will, you know, anticipate a need for either keeping partial uh, driveway open. But for majority portion of the time, we anticipate the driveway. That's a good point, Anon. It typically, the roadway work will happen at the end of the project. Um, so they're going to be focusing on the bridge for the majority of the time uh, that the detour is in place. So um, there are provisions in the maintenance and protection of traffic um, provisions in the contract. Uh, the contractor is required to keep access to all properties all the time. And if they can't keep the access for a short period of time, if they're paving or whatever, they have to coordinate that with the, with the property owner ahead of time. So. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, that was extremely helpful. We have one other comment from Barbara, uh, more of a concern. So Sealy Road is considered a scenic historic local road. Uh, traffic detour will be tough on those neighbors. Uh, she claims that it's windy and stone walls are also in the area for either visual or physical impairments um, to impact the sight lines. She's not sure what you can do here. Just please make a note of it uh, going forward in the design here. Yeah, that's a, another excellent point. Um, we've driven both detour routes. Um, we've, we usually select two routes because uh, we're not sure which one is gonna be preferred uh, at the time this goes to construction. Um, but during design, the designer will uh, take another look at these detour routes. You know, we looked at them kind of a cursory review during the 30% just uh, to make sure that there are uh, viable routes, um, but they will be vetted out during design. And situations that uh, seem either unsafe um, or that need some improvement will be will be looked at and addressed. And you know the the best detour route will be selected. But we appreciate feedback like that from residents um, because that does help us uh, in the design process. So thank you for that comment. And what I would like to add to Jeff is that the final selection of the detour route will be made, uh, you know, based on the recommendation of uh, the town of Wilton and Frank Medical. So the town will be involved in the process. All right. Um, 
All right, and we have another concern slash question, um, also from Barbara. Is repairing and planting including uh, included along the Norwalk River, and will we do any planting rest uh, restoration after construction? Tom, do you want to talk about the planting uh, planting concept? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's on any of the uh, drawings. Right. So, I mean, this is on and here from CHA. So, uh, no matter what, if any, uh, any, any site disturbances, if we are intend to uh, have a site restoration plan, obviously we will look at the site specifics and come up with the uh, with the detail. Uh, Tom Bulzak, would you, would you like to add anything to that, or? Uh, sure. Uh, this is Tom Bulzak of Eco Design. I'm a member of the CLE team. Uh, as part of the construction, in uh, there will be well in in the, in the final design, the next stage of the process, there will be a development of the planting plan, uh, which will detail the planting of uh, small trees or brushes or, or other type of vegetation uh, along the corridor of the roadway. Also, as part of the uh, detailed review by the regulatory agencies. It is typically expected that there will be trees uh, planted within the uh, riparian area uh, when disturbed in order to provide shade to the to the water course, which is relevant to uh, habitat considerations. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much, Tom. If there are any other questions at this time, we're still happy to answer. All right, we have a question from Mary. How do you feel about the commercial businesses being affected during this long construction process? So these, these projects are always, they're always difficult. Um, uh, we're, we're working on uh, two bridges right now. Again, Lover's Lane and Arrowhead. Arrowhead's in a residential neighborhood. Lover's Lane is adjacent to, um, to Merwin Meadows Park. Um, so there's always, um, there's always concerns with the abutting uh, um, uh, business owners. Um, and the key, the key to, you know, the key to the project is keeping the driveway entrances open. Um, so that so that customers can, customers can get in, um, you know there is a concern with residents are coming on Cannon Road, um, like from the Weston area, uh, they would have to go all the way around, all the way around, all the way around the bridge uh, to get to the business owners. Uh, but coming from Route Seven, coming from Route Seven, um, it'll be open to get into the uh, to get into the driveways. All right, thank you, Frank. Uh, we have one other question related to detour traffic uh, from Sarah. Who will coordinate with the public school system to assess impact to the bus routes? Uh, bus volume will increase on Pippelog, and mm -hmm. it's a dangerous road. The Siri, uh, CLE will uh, require turns on Route 7. How will some of that be addressed? So, so we'll end up working with the, uh, the Board of Ed and the bus company um, to let them know about the project. Uh, they would have to go around on Pippawag or Sealy Road um, um, to get to their to get to the bus stops and, and to get to school. Uh, but we will uh, coordinate. Uh, we will coordinate with the bus company. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Barbara. Will you add a crosswalk to the south side of the road from the new sidewalk? The Grange Hall has a number of larger events who park in the commuter lot. So uh, um, there's, and, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there is a crosswalk um, from the commuter lot uh, going to the Grange, um, shown, right, shown right there with the, uh, the, blue, the, blue, the blue arrow, the blue dot. Um, so, that, so there will be, there will be a crosswalk there. Yeah, Frank, I, I can confirm. There, there is a crosswalk there now, so we're looking to maintain that. Pretty much in the same location, um, which is right at the end of our new sidewalk. Yeah, but is, I don't think there's a pedestrian push button there, right? But there's not a pedestrian light there. 
suspect there's not. Okay. Yeah, Frank, adding a pedestrian uh, signal pedestal would be outside the scope of the project. Yeah. You'd probably not be a participating expense as yeah. part of the program. And there's not one there now, correct? Okay. I don't think there's one there now. Still accepting any questions if anyone has any other last burning, burning questions that you'd like to ask us. And again, if you have a question that pops into your head in the next couple of days or even weeks, we're happy to assess and address everything as they come in at the following methods. Zoom Q&A feature is open for the rest of this meeting. You can call by phone and leave a voicemail or leave us an email at dot at ct.gov. And again, I definitely appreciate the questions um, and any any comments, any information that you have for us, because it'll definitely help us with uh, design considerations. Yes, piggybacking off of Frank, um, we're still at a thirty percent design completion, so we are still absolutely able to make slight design changes accordingly if there are concerns with things. So it's never too late to bring up um, a concern or a comment on the project. Oh, we have one last question from Atala Duke. Uh, where will you keep the construction material and machinery uh, before, during, and after the project? So the so the site's going to be very tight. Um, the machine that they're going to use is going to be uh, limited to the space between. Uh, the closest driveway and the bridge on both sides is, is what would end up happening. Um, as, as far as material, uh, there's, there's some space um, at the intersection of Pimpawag and Cannon Road um, behind, the, you know, behind the curb area. Um, and then the, um, then the rest of the material that they're gonna need, they're going to have to bring it as, as needed. Um, as needed. The, the two other bridges that we're working on, um, there's Arrowhead Bridge and Lover's Lane Bridge is, is just as tight as this. And um, there's a little bit of space on Arrowhead where there's some there's some materials, but they're bringing in materials as, as they use them. And Lover's Lane, um, Lover's Lane is even tighter. It's probably just as tight as this. And he's, he's going to bring in, bring in material as, as they use it. Andrew, it looks like we have one more question from Atala. Yes. Part of the driveway of Cannon Hall will be used for that. Did I hear you correctly? Um, Frank or Tom, if you want to. I, I, did, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Oh, the driveway will be used for that. I, I don't believe so because the contractor is going to be required to operate within any um, any town right away or any temporary construction easements that have been acquired. And we can't really block driveways off entirely but tom if you want to expand on that yeah and this is Anand. uh the other other thing is if uh, you know as, as frank mentioned the, the space is limited and if he needs any additional uh, space for uh you know keeping the material 
he will have to find an alternate space or sometimes uh, Frank, uh, the, uh, the uh, public works department uh, has space where you know, they can temporarily use that. I don't know if that's the case with the town of Wilton, but I've seen that in other towns where uh, the towns provide some space uh, for temporary storage of material, if that's required. Yeah, I mean, there, there may be some other space in, um, in Wilton, um, but again, it's really like as they as they use as they need the material, they would have to uh, truck it from whether it's from their yard or whether it's from another space space in Wilton is what we have. It's a it's a tight project. It'll be it'll be a tough project, and then mm -hmm. we'll, and we'll have some input from whoever the low bidder is. He may have some other thoughts, um, but uh, we do recognize that it's that it's a um, that's a very tight site, and there will be an access will be maintained, but it's. It is ultimately up to the contractor to determine locations for stockpile areas. And when we get into major construction with the beams and culvert, it's going to be, things will be trucked in as they come that day. It's not going to be, there's beams are not going to be sitting at the project site for extended periods of time. If there's any clarification that can be put on equipment storage, not only material storage, it would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, again, to reiterate, you know, uh, the, as, as Mark was mentioning and as Frank was mentioning, the intent of the contractor or the contract documents will require the contractor to use the space within the town right of way or the temporary construction easement areas and not to block any of the driveways. And if he needs more uh, space, he has to, you know, there'll be a way for him to find space outside of the project limits. So the intent will never be to block any of the driveway or anything during the contract. He will not be allowed to do that. That's correct. Any other questions, comments, or concerns at this time or welcome? We'll keep the window open for another minute before we shut down for the evening. But again, I'd like to reiterate all of the comments that you made tonight were appreciated and will be incorporated into the design if they have not yet. And you have another two weeks in order to come up with comments or concerns that will be addressed immediately. All right, Mark. I think we can conclude the uh, question and answer portion and this public info. As Andrew and everyone else had stated, if you have any questions that come up, you can reach to it, reach out to us via email. And we appreciate your input. Thank you very much and have a pleasant evening. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it too.